Thanks for checking out the Ideal Impact Podcast, where we discuss five key skills and the impact they can have on your life as well as some major issues in society. You ready to get after it? So Randy is on vacation. So my partner, Randy Myers, and, and actually Brian Swick, so both of them are on the podcast with me. They are in Disney World with their families this week. So you get the one-on-one Kyle experience, Mike. Um, and today we have Mike Ayala, investor, speaker, entrepreneur, father, and the host of Investing for Freedom podcast, which I've shared a couple of times on the Ideal Impact Podcast Instagram page. So Mike, thanks for being on the show. Man, thanks for having me. I'm excited to do it. This is going to be fun. That's the point. We got to keep it keep it light, but um, but get down into the uh, the big things in life and and what's really important. So that's what we do here on the Ideal Impact Podcast. Um, so Mike, if you could just give us a little bit of, of your story and we'll get into it. I got some, some questions for you and I really want to talk about something that I've realized I really want out of life and that is freedom of time. And I thought it was perfect timing because you just recently had, uh, an episode on the, on the investing for freedom podcast about that specifically. So, um, so again, just kind of, if you could just give us a little brief background in your story and, and we'll go from there. You know, on, on that note, and then I'll, and then I'll dive into it. I think, you know, I just, I just think we got to be so cognizant of the seasons that we're in, man, because, um, you know, a couple months back and a lot of people that know me, you know, you and I've spent a lot of time talking, um, gone pretty deep. A lot of people that know me would say that I was crazy when I make this statement that I'm about to make, but a couple months back, I was talking with my wife. We were out on a walk. We try to walk every day together and just, you know, reconnect. And we've been married for 24 years, by the way. Um, and I was, I was telling her, I said, you know, I kind of feel, and you know, this, we run in, you know, we run in, in some circles with some guys like GoBundance and, you know, some of these guys are worth 200 million, 40 million. And, right. and sometimes I just feel like I'm playing small. Right. And so I tell my wife, I'm like, you know, I kind of feel like a lot of, you know, my success was in the first 10, 12 years of, of my career. Um, and I kind of feel like I've been slacking the last like 10 years and, you know, and I think we all get into this comparison zone that we got to be really careful of and real cognizant of those seasons. And when you're talking about time freedom, we have to constantly check back in with, you know, what does that mean for us? Like, what do we actually, okay, so let's assume you have that time freedom. What are you doing it for? Like, what are you actually going to fill that time freedom with? And that's so important. But I'm telling my wife, I feel like, I feel like maybe I've been slacking the last 10 years, you know, like I'm, uh, you know, we got like, we're, I feel like I'm like a NASCAR and I'm in like 13th place when I compare myself to some of these other guys. And it's like, you know what, Kyle, you're running your own race and it's your race. And we've got to be careful with the comparison with other people, which everybody talks about, but we also have to be careful with the comparison of different versions and seasons of ourselves. So anyway, I tell my wife, I said, you know, I kind of feel like a lot of my success was in the early years. And then we pause and we start talking through this and thinking about it. And my oldest is 23. My middle son, uh, Tim, is 21 and Caitlin's 19. By the way, she just moved to Ireland. So we're like legit empty nesters now. Oh, and, wow. and I'm like, you know what? We did the last 10 years, what we set out to do. We, we wanted to be super present. You know, we wanted to finish the race strong with our children. And we did that. And by the way, I had success in the last 10 years. It was just, you know, I, 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 sometimes we, sometimes we have the wrong benchmarks. And so I, I wanted to point that out first and foremost, because, um, you know, when you talk about time freedom, again, we got to be really careful, like making sure that when we achieve that time freedom, because most of us probably have higher expectations of what it's going to take to get there than what it'll actually be because, because we we're going to fill it with a bunch of things that don't really matter or expectations that are put on us elsewhere. So anyway, I don't know. Do you want me to get into my backstory or that was like a little tangent? Oh, yeah. Well, first that's you know, an incredible point that you made there. And I, I feel that heavily, you know, as a new entrepreneur, so I'm 36 years old, don't have any kids. And, you know, a lot of what I'm doing with personal coaching and, you know, helping people become the most disciplined versions of themselves, a lot of what I'm doing is putting out content. And that means a lot of time on social media 
seeing all of these people that are wildly successful by comparison. You know, when I, when I look at other people, that can become this defeating mindset. And I have to constantly remind myself just because they're where they are at this point in time doesn't mean that I'm supposed to be there. Doesn't mean that I have to be there. And it's something that Randy does a great job of my partner pointing out is like, enjoy the process. Like there is so much beauty in all of the things that we have going on as new entrepreneurs that we are then going to be able to take and tell our stories and help people along the same journey that we're on right now. So I think there's a lot of that. And then to your point about what are you going to do with this time freedom, right? And that's where I think daydreaming is super impactful. So that's something that my wife and I did for the first time in a really long time. And the first time ever intentionally was just sit down to daydream. And what we want out of this is when I say freedom of time, I want to be able to be present when we do have kids. And that's the biggest thing for me. My dad was in the Navy for 22 years. So when I was growing up, like in my early childhood, and I loved the fact that he was in military, in the military, I, I, I loved it. I aspired to be like him. But, you know, he wasn't able to be present because of that. He was at sea for three, four months at a time. And it just was something that I took away from. And then when he got out of that, he was very present. But, you know, that was by the time of 1997. So I was 11 years old. Um, you know, that's just something that I really want once we have kids is to be able to be home, to do the things that we want to do um, and to make those memories through epic adventures and creating all that, which is a lot of what I've heard, you know, on your podcast you being present and being able to do those things. So to me, that is success, right? That's, that's my definition of success is to be able to do that and not have to like stress about paying the bills and do all that stuff. I don't need to be wildly wealthy just to, to make enough to have that. And I think that's success in my terms. So yeah, thanks for starting off with that and then sharing your thoughts about it. That was awesome. Yeah. And, you know, I think the thing that um, I, I, I love what you were just saying there, but, you know, behind every one of us is something that drives us when we talk about that success, like, what is it? And it's really easy, Kyle, to get into this zone of like, you know, you talk about wealth. Well, what does wealth really mean? And, and what is success, right? And a lot of times we get lost in a number. Um, you know, even when we talk about our vision boards or whatever, usually there's a number associated with what success looks like. And the problem with that is, um, you know, it's, it's lifestyle creep, but it's also success creep because if I make, I had a mentor ask me this one time, like, when was the last time that you made less money in a certain year than you did the year before? And rarely does that happen unless you're resetting and intentionally doing something. And then there's those seasons like, you know, 2008 for certain people or whatever it is, it happens from time to time, but rarely do you make less. And so rarely are you putting a smaller financial number on your board. And so I think we have to be really careful, as you were saying, like, you know, measuring success by a certain number, because like I said, there's something that drives every single one of us. And when I go back to, um, you know, Karen, and I got married at a pretty early age, just kind of, you know, sharing a little bit about our story. So I was 20, she was 19. We started dating in high school and backing up a little bit further. So I had a dad that was just a, a absolute shithead, um, alcoholic, drug addict, in and out of my life. Um, you know, I didn't understand it at this point, at that point in time, but like he was gone a lot. So I pretty much had the dad that would be like, you know, let's say he's a traveling salesman or, or something like that, but, but he wasn't, he was a, a traveling drug addict and he would literally disappear. And now that I'm older, I, I understand what was happening. He, he'd just be gone. Well, you know, my mom was a gem. Like she, she fought for me and eventually like left him and married my stepdad who's great. I lived with my grandparents. But when I look back, this is the thing that drives and motivates me. So when Karen and I were dating in high school, we spent a ton of time, Kyle, just dreaming about, you know, what life would look like in the future and, and all of that. And the one thing that I always knew is that like, you can learn as much from your bad experiences as you do your good. And there's so many people that if you really kind of pull back the curtain on them that had a, they had a good life. I talk to people all the time that had a good life. They were raised in middle America. And this is the problem with the American dream. They're raised in middle America. There was no pressure on them, really. You know, they did what they're supposed to do. They became a B student or an A student. They went off to college. Somebody put something on them. Hopefully, you know, it was a, a drive to change the world. But most of the time, it's like this, this idealism that somebody else, you know, built into them. And the problem with middle America or middle anything is just how crowded it is. And, and when you look at somebody, you can learn a ton 
from parents that were great. You can learn a ton from amazing experiences, but if you really talk to anybody that's really making major changes and, and Im impacting the world, there, there's something, there's something that really drives and motivates them. And for me, it was being raised with no money. I mean, literally going to McDonald's and getting a happy meal and that little Lego toy. Um, yeah. You can see up behind me. I I've got, I still play with Legos by the way, as a side note, um, <laughs> I, 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 and, and you'd be surprised at how many successful, um, guys still build Legos at the end of the day. But, uh, anyway, that's a little side tangent yeah. going to McDonald's and getting that little, uh, Lego toy out of the happy meal was like a highlight of my life. Like every six months, that's like how poor I grew up and having a dad that was, you know, drunk, gone, when him and my mom would like split up, I'd go stay with him for a little bit. And like, I literally remember like hookers, prostitutes, drugs. I knew what weed smelled like, you know, long before I should have. But those are the kind of things that when Karen and I started talking about designing a life with intention, I wanted to be a present father. I wanted to be a present husband. I wanted to, yes, I wanted success, but I wanted success for a very specific reason. And Karen and I said this from an early age. We would much rather make memories over possessions. But what we realized was when you keep the right things, the right things, typically success comes along with that, right? And that's what I'm really getting at here is like, you know, success is not a number. It's, it's an experience. It's a, it's a milestone. It's being present with those that we love. And so um, I, I, I'll, I'll kind of throw this back to you. But the thing when Kara and I you know, we're really talking about all this. And then again, we got married at an early age. I was 20, she was 19. Dylan came literally one year and one week after we got married. And that's the one thing that I can say, um, you know, because I was, as we were married, like I was working out of town, I was literally working a hundred plus hours a week. Kara was pregnant with our third kid. I was like, I was, I was that not present husband and dad that we were talking about, but more from a normal perspective, I was just you know, away for work. And, and Karen, and I woke up one day, Kyle, and, and, and realized very quickly. So I was 23 years old when I had this realization, I was running a crew of like 16, running a three and a half million dollar project working for somebody else. And I realized like, even though I wasn't the drug addict alcoholic at that point in time, um, that my dad was, by the way, I had gone through a stint in that in high school. Like I went off the deep end meth, all kinds of stuff. But, um, you know, even though I wasn't, I was a sober person at that point in time, um, I wasn't the present dad. And so that's what kind of really like launched us into our journey of entrepreneurship, investing, et cetera. We woke up one day and we're like, this is not what we signed up for. She's pregnant with our third child, Caton, And, and I'm missing this. I'm missing my sons growing up. And we launched a business at the age of 24. And so that's kind of where like the rubber met the road, like, you know, the old saying the rubber, where the rubber meets the road. Um, that's what was kind of one of those things. And here's the thing. And, and then I'll toss it back to you. It doesn't matter what we say. Okay, I'm going to be a present husband. I'm going to be a present dad. Yes, I'm going to have success in life. What typically happens is we buy into that same old, you know, downward spiral of, yes, I'm working out of town. Yes, I'm working 100 plus hours a week, but I'm making good money. I'm, 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 I'm building a career and I'm doing it for my family. And that was one of them check-in points that Karen and I had at a very early age where I, I couldn't lie to myself. I couldn't look myself in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm doing this for my family. And I get it. Sometimes there's seasons where we have to put our head down and we have to do the hard shit for our family. But this was like, this is one of those moments where I was like, if I keep going down this road, I'm going to be telling myself the same excuse. And so we, we left and started our own business. And, and that's what kind of catapulted us into entrepreneurship. Yeah, for sure. What, and what I, so the first thing that you said in there that really like struck with me was, or, or stuck with me was about that number. When you put a number out there that you determine this number is going to make me successful, then you start tying your identity to it. And what happens when that number is no longer there? So that was something that I experienced greatly when I was transitioning from full-time W-2 work to entrepreneurship is I, and I didn't even realize it, right? So I had set this goal for myself to, by the time I was 30, to make $100,000 a year. And I met that goal. And, you know, as I continued in my career, I started making a little bit more money, a little bit more money. Right. And when I left my W2 job, I lost part of my identity because now I'm in full-time entrepreneurship. Any money that I make is going straight back into the business. I can't kind of hang my hat on that salary anymore. And I didn't realize how much that was impact, like impacting me. 
And what I realized was I was, I was too focused about money instead of living my purpose. Once I transitioned my identity to become my personal purpose statement, which is to inspire and guide people to become the most disciplined versions of themselves so they can build consistency in their actions and achieve the results out of life that they want. Once I started identifying as that person who lived that mission, I felt this huge weight lifted off my shoulder. There was no more pressure to make X amount of dollars or have this financial success. It was like, I trusted that as long as I lived that personal purpose statement, that all the other success would follow. But that was the person that I needed to be. So that was, that was the one thing that, that you said in there that really stuck out. And then also, like, if you want to be a present father or mother or spouse or whatever it may be, that's the identity that you need to adopt. Well, how do I become that? Just do the things that a, the, a present person would do, and eventually that will become habit, and you will live that life. And then also something that we talk about a lot is discipline, right? That's, that's the foundation of the ideal skills is really discipline. Because if you can be disciplined, you can be more emotionally intelligent, you can be more loyal, all of those things associated with it. But it's about balance. If you're just 100% all in discipline on one thing, whether it's business or fitness or something along those lines, well, then how can you be that present person elsewhere? So it's not about discipline in one area of life. It's about using discipline to achieve as much balance within life as you can, right? Constantly, I look at life as like a pie chart and there's all these different slices of, of you know, family and professional, you know, business. It's about trying to consistently readjust and refocus balance. So you're dedicating, you know, that time and that discipline where it, you know, fulfills and aligns with your purpose. So a lot of great pieces in there, Mike. That was that was absolutely awesome. Um, so I had a question for you too. So you were you were like the way that I look at your story, and you shared a lot of that. But like your proof that you can start anywhere, and and in my terms, like make it big. So you know, why don't we start with like your you or you shared that. But like, how do you see the ideal skills? So intentionality, discipline, emotional intelligence, accountability, loyalty. Like, what are some some points in that story that you just shared with us where those things really stuck out? And, you know, how did you how did those impact you along the way? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, first and foremost, on the accountability front, and I've shared this, you know, with you and and in other groups that you and I've been part of mm -hmm. together. And um, the accountability piece is probably one of the most important for me. And I'll, I'll tell you why. So I'm not a disciplined person. Discipline is not like, um, I, in fact, I was just before we jumped on this podcast, um, I was getting my ass handed to me by a mentor of mine, <laughs> um, you know, because <laughs> like, just, I, it, it's not in my nature. Um, I have to really, I have to really, really, really um, work hard at discipline and consistency because I'm like, I'm an extreme visionary, like type A, um, but discipline has not been a strong suit of mine. In fact, my, my wife, like when it comes to like physical health, like she kicks my ass, like she's so much more disciplined than I am, but I've realized a lot about myself, Kyle, in the sense that like, I get bored really easy and I hate consistency and I hate, um, you know, the mundane, I, I need, I need to mix things up. I even like, I have to work in different, uh, like locations and, and so knowing yourself is extremely important, but I'll just key in on accountability. So when I launched my business, in 2004. And this is probably one of the biggest secrets to my success. There's that old saying, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you need to find a bigger room. That's me. So many people are like, Mike, you know, you've taught me so much. And like, you're one of the smartest guys I know. And I'm like, no, like, I've just, I realize that I need to be in bigger rooms. And, and here's, if there's one thing that's been a superpower of mine, it's getting in bigger rooms, finding people that are smarter than me, and just doing exactly what they tell me. And so from an accountability standpoint, and you might be able to tie like discipline and accountability together, but the reality is, is I'm not very self-disciplined. So I need that accountability and I need that mentorship. And so in 2004, when we started that business, I was a plumber, by the way, in the field, working in the field, didn't have any business experience. I didn't go to college. I didn't have an accounting degree. I didn't have a business degree. I didn't do any sales. I didn't know anything about marketing. And so I went and found... And if there's one thing that's been the secret to my success, it's this. I went and found the best um, advisors, mentors, uh, vendors. I have this kind of quadrant 
which I'll just mention. But in my mind, I think there's four keys to successful business when it comes to just brick and mortar businesses. And number one is obviously taking care of employees. Well, there's no obvious because I, I don't rank these in order. But if the employees are taken care of, the investors or the owners, shareholders are taken care of, um, and the obviously the clients are taken care of, there's a fourth component for me. It's vendors, it's coaches, it's mentors. If If those are equally part of the team and taken care of, there's a lot of people that'll take their vendors and just, you know, throw them out the window for, uh, you know, a half a percent savings or whatever. I've always been the guy that will pay 2%, 3% more for a vendor that, you know, fits with me. And so in starting that business, I went and found the best coaching and consulting company that I could possibly find in the country. And I hired them. I spent money that I didn't have on it. And I just did exactly what they told me to do. And our business scaled from a startup in 2004, by the end of that year, not even a full year, by the way, we launched in like June of, of 2004. By the end of that year, we were doing a million dollars in revenue just under, and I had like 17 employees just doing exactly what they told me to do and doing it. And by 2009, we were on the Inc. fastest growing companies in America. I had over a hundred employees at one point in time, and I sold that business in, in 2014. Also simultaneously, like I, I got my, my CPA is telling me, Hey, you need to buy real estate. You got tax problems. Um, I've got somebody that's advising me in my life, like anybody that is really wealthy, you know, makes their money doing something. They have this flywheel and then they invest it in real estate. When I hear things like that, Kyle, my, my brain latches onto it and I say, okay, if them, if, if they can do it, I can do it. And so I went on this journey simultaneously of like figuring out real estate. Kara and I, by the time we sold our business in 2014, we had 45 single family properties. We had five mobile home parks. I'd bought three commercial buildings. And this was just kind of like, you know, passively, this wasn't my main business. I had my flywheel, which I'll drop a little, you know, thing that I will say till the day I die. So many people get distracted and they want to, they want to shut down their business. They want to shut down their medical practice. They want to quit their W2 job. And I'm okay with that. If your W2 job is not helping you achieve your goals, by all means, you know, do what you need to do. But the most successful people that I know in life including my track record, it's easy for me to sit here now and tell you, hey, you know what? Passive income, set a passive income goal, get out of the rat race. But if I look at my success backwards, I had a flywheel. It was my business and it was spinning off cash. And I worked my ass off and I had a bunch of employees and I would be at the office at you know six o'clock every single day. Um, yes, I went on vacations. Yes, I had time freedom. Yes, I could leave at two o'clock in the afternoon. I built my business that way. And so I was present with my kids, but I wasn't a 10 hour entrepreneur. I didn't have this lifestyle business that so many people today. In fact, one of my mentors said this a few weeks back. He said, your lifestyle business is going to keep you from finding the true success and fulfillment and happiness that you really want in life. And so there's this like, there's this middle ground between lifestyle business, working 10 hours a week. I, I've had that. Yeah. But I also like if those times that I was doing that, it was because I was present and I had something else driving me. Nobody wants to sit on a beach, you know, for 50, 60, 80 hours a week and work 10 hours a week for very long. There's seasons where we want to do this, but we have to be careful. So most people that are successful, just like my track record, I had a flywheel, spinning off capital, pouring it into real estate. So I had a pretty good portfolio when I sold that business in, in 2014. And again, the key takeaway with that is, you know, I just, at every single point, I try to find the smartest person that's already identify the problem find the person that's doing it best, figure out how to get into their world, pay them and do exactly what they tell you. And that, to me, that's like, that's the key to success. Yeah. So it's, so the way that I look at that, so I, I, when I'm talking to clients about discipline and accountability, right? So I, I personally feel that are, are some people naturally more disciplined than others? Sure. But as human beings, we're, we're not really disciplined because we're constantly looking for the safest route, the easiest route, right? And it takes a lot of discipline to push yourself out of that comfort zone into the unknown and experience that next level growth. So I look at that as we sometimes need to borrow accountability in order to turn it into discipline. Like it's hard for me to go out. So I'm, I'm doing a, I'm training for a marathon. So I'm going to run it. First of all, I am not a runner. I hate running naturally. However, I decided if I don't do this now, while I still can, once I'm too old to do it, 
I'm going to regret that. So I'm like, all right, let's go out and do it now. I am not going to go out and run for an hour or like I did this morning, 90 minutes without some accountability at this point in time. So I hired a running coach who knows how to train for those things, who is, is doing ultra marathons, right? So I'm borrowing the accountability now to the point where eventually I won't need that. I will become disciplined because it becomes habit. So I heard some of that in there for you or when what you were saying there. And then you were talking about surrounding yourself with the right people. And you had these mentors, especially when you were first starting out. And to this day, it sounds like as well, because you just mentioned that you got your ass chewed by one of your mentors. So when that was going on, like when you were first starting out, is that who you were being held accountable or were you holding yourself accountable because you wanted to be a really good mentee to your mentor in order to repay them? I think it's a combination of both. Um, the one thing that I've learned, you know, I think it's getting into what like you're truly good at, which I think a lot of us just become, you know, a, a universalist. Like I, I think most of us don't ever really figure out like what are the one, two, three things that I'm really good at and stay in that lane. It's not that difficult for me to remain disciplined if I'm in the things that I'm really good at. But the counter argument to that is like, do you have to be disciplined if you're only staying in the things that, you know, you really love and enjoy and are naturally talented and good at? And so I think there's a, you know, I think there's a theme in there that you have to be really cognizant of. I typically have to be disciplined during periods of time where I'm doing something that I don't enjoy doing. And I think one of the keys to my success is when I see something in the business arena that I'm not great at. In fact, I, I created this, um, I created this quadrant called the genius quadrant and it's a spreadsheet and you literally put, cause I've used this myself for years. What are the things that I have to do? What are the things that I should do? And what are the things that I shouldn't do? And then I rank them on a scale of one to 10, whether I excel it at it or, and if I enjoy it. And there's a lot of things that are in the column of the things that I shouldn't do that I'm actually good at. And maybe I enjoy it, but you could argue that I shouldn't be doing it because it's a $10 an hour task. And so when, when I look at these things, if you're going to find true success in life, you're constantly going to have to take things off of your plate that even if, sometimes if you enjoy it, which doesn't require discipline usually, but there's some things that you're going to have to take off of your plate in order to do higher value tasks that only you can be doing in your organization at this point in time that maybe you don't enjoy, which requires discipline, and maybe you don't excel at it, which requires growth opportunities. And so I built this spreadsheet because for years, whether it was me or you know somebody on my team, and this is how far back this goes, but I just take a legal pad, it'd be on the side of my desk, and I draw three columns, have to do, should do, shouldn't do. And if somebody on my team is overwhelmed or stressed out, I'd tell them, I'd say, listen, I want you to take a legal pad, draw the columns. And every single time you've got something going on or something comes up that yours is a task for you, put it in one of those columns. And then we're going to meet in a week and we're going to meet in two weeks and we're going to meet in four weeks. And we're going to look at the things that are on your have to, should do, shouldn't do list. And we're going to, we're going to talk through this together and see where they actually belong. And that's the best way to figure out how to delegate some things. But anyway, I finally turned this into an Excel sheet that charts it on a quadrant. And the quadrant is um, a burnout zone. So anything that you are constantly doing that you do not excel at and you do not enjoy, if you do that too long, you're, that's burnout zone. And then there's growth zone. So if there's things that you enjoy, but you don't excel at, that's a growth opportunity because you enjoy it, but you don't excel. Hire a coach. You're going to need some accountability through that, but probably not as much because if you enjoy it, you don't need accountability. Then there's the zone of discipline where really when we look at that, this is, this is where we really need the accountability because I'm probably, maybe I excel at it to some degree, but I probably don't enjoy it. And it's on my list of things that I really have to do at this point in time. That's where I need the most accountability. And then there's the zone of genius. These are the things that I excel at and I really enjoy. And if we can figure out like how to spend most of our time on those things, we don't really need discipline because it's going to come natural to us. And maybe it was something that, you know, five years ago, I needed discipline, accountability, coaching through, but because I enjoyed it, I, I became a master at it and it moves over into that zone of genius 
and we no longer need the accountability around it. And we're really good at it. And so the more we can figure out how to spend our time in that and the zone of delegation, by the way, um, if it's in burnout zone, delegate it. If it's in that delegation zone, delegate it. If it's up here in the growth opportunity, you have to make a decision. How much do I really enjoy it? Because in order to get good at it and move it over to the zone of genius, I'm going to need to invest in a coach. I'm going to need to invest in a program. I'm going to need to really work at a new skill set. You're talking a marathon, right? And it, by the way, this isn't just for work. You're talking a marathon. This is something that, you know, you're going to move one way or another at some point in time. And all of these things fall into one of those categories. And when we can actually see it and chart it, this is going to determine whether you're going to invest the money in coaching or not, or invest the money in somebody to delegate that to that can do it better than you. And so I think, you know, there's this, all this accountability delegation, like only do the things that you're really good at dollar productive activities. By the way, I believe in all of that, but the reality at the end of the day is if you don't really know where to rank those, how do you know there's things that are below my pay grade that I'm never going to delegate because I love them and I'm really good at it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so much, there's so many good nuggets in there, Mike. Uh, one of the biggest, one, a couple of big things, discipline to not do things that you shouldn't be. So they, I think we often look at discipline as I have to do this. Well, discipline also comes into play to make those decisions say, I shouldn't be doing this. Even though I enjoy doing it, maybe it's something that I shouldn't be doing because I could be spending that time on higher dollar activities, or even though I really enjoy it, I might not be the best at it and I could pay somebody to do it even better than me. So I look at that right now with growing the podcast and content creation, social media stuff. I enjoy doing those things. I enjoy creating content, but I know I'm not the best at it. So that is one of the biggest things for me that I want to hire out as soon as I possibly can, is I know that somebody can take the things that I do, the things that I say and make really good content out of it. That's not me. You know, I'm I actually today, one of the things on my schedule is to watch YouTube videos to learn how to be better at YouTube shorts. But that's not really like, I, I know that I'm just, I'm not a tech person. I'm never going to be that good at it. As much as I enjoy it, I, I need to find somebody else that can do that better. And that's just going to expedite the growth of my business 10 times if I can find somebody that knows what time to post that content, knows what's what's the best thing to post at that time and what days and all of that stuff, stuff that I just don't know. Um, and then, oh, and that was the other thing that I said was, or that I wrote down was just because you enjoy it doesn't mean that you're the best at it. So again, like I think that there is so much that goes into discipline. And then also the things that you don't like might be because you're just not good at them yet. So in that opportunity zone where you're talking about try that out and be consistent with it for an extended period of time before you make a decision on whether or not it's adding value to you, whether or not you're good at it, whether or not you enjoy it. Cause I feel that a lot of people will do things for like two weeks and then make this decision. Ah, this isn't for me. I'm not getting any value out of it. Like if I would have done that with running specifically, I would have quit already, but I pushed through for months at a time. And I finally had these breakthroughs where I'm like, no, I actually, as much, as much pain as it causes me some days, as much as I'm not a natural runner, now that I push through that wall, I do see the enjoyment of it. And for me, the enjoyment of it comes from just doing things every day that I've never done before. Today, I ran 90 minutes. I've never ran 90 minutes before in my entire life. And I was in the military. And I, you know, the most I had ever run in the military was like five miles. I ran 8.6 today. If I had quit, I would have been miserable the rest of the day because I knew I gave up. I knew I half-assed it. I knew I didn't give 100%, but I just pushed through, leveraged that discipline, especially in the last like, 30 minutes. It was like I was hitting a wall. And then one more thing with that is there is, this is all a mindset. Like when it comes to discipline, accountability, loyalty, all of the things that we talk about, it's all, a, it's all a mindset and it doesn't apply to one specific area of life. Like you had mentioned, it's not just about business, but I can apply the same mindset to family, to running, to fitness, whatever it may be, it's transferable across the board at all of those things. And I think that's one thing that we get so caught up on. It's like, you know, well, I should just be naturally good at being a dad or being a you know husband or something like that. It's like, 
no, like th there, there's always work to be done. Like, even if you are naturally good at it, you can always be better. So figure out how to do that. And that's where enjoying the process comes in for me specifically. I, you know, if I'm on this constant pursuit of getting better, I better enjoy the process because the, the end game is never going to happen. There is no end. It's constantly just trying to get better and better and better through discipline, through accountability, through all of these other skills that we talk about. So yeah, just amazing, extremely insightful there, Mike. Really appreciate that. Um, another thing too, so obviously in everything that you said there, one thing that I took away was that community is key. So surrounding yourself with the right coaches, with you know a mastermind. So obviously you're a member of Go Abundance and then you have a, a mastermind of your own as well. So you know, really clear to me that, that you're big on community and to help others. So is that like, probably if, if somebody doesn't know where to start, like I was really, I, I didn't know where to invest or how to invest. And one of the best pieces of advice that I got was invest in yourself first. If you're not sure on what to invest in, invest in yourself first. And the way that I did that was surrounding myself with community, joining, you know, Go Abundance Emerge and hiring a personal development coach and Aaron Belke. Those have been huge for me. So would you say the same thing? If like somebody's out there and they're like, I want to, start investing, but I don't know what to do. Would it be to invest in themselves first? Yes. And you're going to make some mistakes on that as well. You know, just a quick example of that. When I was, um, you know, running my successful business, I was looking back at a journal the other day and we were sitting in Hawaii and I think it was 2005. And so I'm like a year into starting my business and I wanted to start investing in real estate. My, my coach at BDR, which was the consulting company, had made this comment from stage. He said, if your business isn't helping you achieve your personal goals, you just own a job. And that hit me right between the eyes because I had left my job, started this business, and then all of a sudden I'm like, you know, there's that old saying that entrepreneurs are the only people in the world that'll quit a 40-hour-a-week job making $100,000 a year to go work 80 hours a week to make 40, right? And it's like, I didn't want to buy into that. Like, I didn't want to... I didn't want to go backwards. And so when I heard that, I was like, okay, my wife and I set a goal of two income producing properties a year for 10 years when I heard that. So I was thinking to myself, like, man, if I could get 20 properties to, you know, 10 years from now, I'd be 34, 35 years old. And then by the time I'm 60, they'd all be paid off. And when I'm still running this business, I'd have this 20, you know, house portfolio um, that I could just retire off of. And so to answer your question, I'm like, okay, so I want to invest in real estate. My CPA is telling me to invest in real estate. My coach is telling me, you know, I, I, I need some kind of passive income. I need to build wealth. Like, how do I do this? And I'm at Barnes and Noble and like the CD series, like kind of jumps off the table at me. It's Dolph Drews. Um, I don't know most of your audience probably doesn't even know him. He's not like he, he, he's on Instagram, but he doesn't teach like he used to. So it was a 16, um, CD series called the real estate investors college. And it just kind of like, like jumped off the table at me. And, and so I'm in Reno, Nevada, and I plugged the CD into the car. That's how long ago this was. And, <laughs> and I drive five hours from Reno, Nevada to Elko, which is where I lived at that point in time. I literally wanted to drop my kids off and my wife and just freaking keep driving because I'm like just absorbing this, you know, CD series that I think I paid $49.99 for. Let me draw a parallel. So I got excited about that. And I literally went and bought two single family houses, just listening to that CD series and doing what he told me to do a $49 coach in a box. Right. Um, then natural progression. I sign up for rich dad, real estate coaching. I paid $12,000. I, I was looking at the journal and I mentioned this, you know, I'm sitting in Hawaii and I'm taking a phone call. Um, this is before zoom. So we're, we're doing this on a phone call and, and I, I paid $12,000 and this is like, I'm sitting in Hawaii and it's like module six, like live call number six. And this guy's teaching me shit that I learned in Dolph's CD series, like in, in CD number three. And I paid $12,000. By the end of that $12,000 coaching, I learned less from that than I did Dolph DeRusse's $49.99 CD series. So my point in all this, and maybe that was because I learned so much from Dolph in his $49 CD series. Maybe it's because I'm an executor. So when I learn something, I just go apply it. But I think the important thing is the answer to your question is yes. But I think we really have to identify what is it that we're missing and like, what information do I need and who's the best person to get it from? Because so many times, you know, if you really look at somebody that's teaching something, 
The question that I want to ask at the end of the day, I love Warren Buffett's quote, Wall Street is the only place in the world where somebody drives a Rolls Royce to take advice from somebody who took the subway. And there's nothing wrong with that. But also at the end of the day, I want to make sure when I'm looking at coaching and programs, et cetera, I paid $12,000 to learn from a guy who was a certified rich dad coach that I think probably owned less real estate than I did at that point in time. And, and then I learned for $49.99 from a guy that had like 10,000 properties across the country at that point in time. And so it's just information. It's not necessarily just because you pay hundred thousand dollars for some information doesn't mean it's the best information. And I'm not opposed. I've paid hundred thousand dollars to be in masterminds. My, 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 my final comment on this is get really clear on what you need, because I'm a huge fan of coaching, 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 accountability, 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 um, courses. I still pay for courses. I literally just went through Russell Brunson's like click funnels course from years ago. I paid $2,000 because I want to learn. Um, you know, I've got people that can do this for me, but we're missing some key components. So I paid to do this course and I sat down and I went through it. And so, you know, I think really getting clear on what is it that you're missing and who can teach me that, that isn't just a professional teacher. They've actually done the thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so my personal coach is Aaron Velke and he and I talk about identifying the pain. So if I'm experiencing a pain in my life, right? So for my clients, you know, those are people who are dealing with the same pain that I dealt with. And that's what makes me a good fit for those clients is I dealt with the pain of half-assing life. I was half-assing relationships, trying to figure out if W-2 work was for me or entrepreneur and never making decision and diving in 100% on either one of them. I was living in this limbo. Same thing when it came to fitness. And when I go back through my, my high school and college football experiences, it was just full of lack of effort and, and intentionality was missing as well. But you know, so we, anyway, to my point there, Aaron and I talk about identifying somebody who has experienced the same pain that you've experienced and has successfully navigated it and overcome it. And it might, and typically that's going to come with a lot of mistakes that were made in there. Um, you know, mistakes around for me personally, again, half-assing everything and the consequences that came with it. Now I'm taking that and, you know, helping other people experience the joy that comes with not half-assing it, with being disciplined, with going through and giving 100% to whatever it is that you're focused on in that moment. So again, identify it. The way that I interpret that is identify the pain that you're experiencing and then find someone or something that has experienced that same thing and, and has overcome it. And so how would you say, like, what's the best or have you learned anything? Do you have any tips, tricks to, you know, find that right fit? Or is it a little bit of trial and error? I think it's always going to be a little bit of trial and error, but I think one of the, you know, vet, vet the person, like ha have they really done what they say they've done? And the problem with this, Kyle, is a lot of times when we're looking for a coach or a mentor um, or a program, our backs are against the wall. And so we don't have time or we feel like we don't have time to, you know, talk to five different people. Um, and that's the thing that there's this concept of trust your gut. And I've trusted my gut on a lot of things where I've won. And I've trusted my gut on a lot of things where I didn't win. <laughs> and so I, you know, I think there's the, the thing that I will say is I will never work with somebody that I don't like. Yeah. So that's kind of like filter number one. Do I actually like this person? Can I see myself working with them? Can I see myself receiving from them? Because if you can't take the advice and the accountability and learn and listen to them, then it's a non-starter. So that's like kind of filter number one for me. You know, do I, do I like this person? But then it's like, you know, take some time and really make sure that, you know, what, what you need, this person has the track record and the ability to help deliver that. And I will say too, you know, a couple of the things that I've talked through here, like hiring a plumbing and HVAC coach, pretty black and white. You know, what was your success track record? Like, what, you know, how many clients have you coached? What's the, what's the record? And by the way, the way that I found that coach was through train my vendor 
And they actually recommended them. This company built the manual for the best HVAC uh, company, in my opinion, in the world. They built the manual for the people that wanted to become trained comfort specialists. So in order to be a trained comfort specialist, you have to be in the top 2% of HVAC companies in the country and you have to be vetted. So then BDR writes the manual on how those companies would work. So they've already been vetted. Like they're already like, you know, they've got the star of approval. They've got the, the stamp from someone that's easy. The real estate coach, Dolph DeRoos versus real, um, um, uh, Robert Kiyosaki, rich dad coaching. Now, either one of those have a track record. The problem was the thing that I didn't do well enough there was I bought a program for literally a thousand times the price almost, um, and didn't really, I just went with the name and rich dad had changed my mind around so many things that I just automatically assumed that because the stamp was on it, that it was going to be a win. And, and what I should have done was like, ask more questions about, Hey, what level of investor is this for? I just automatically assumed, and this is a, this is a weakness in us. We don't know how great we are because we're us. I just automatically assumed because I had only listened to one CD series and I only owned two rentals that I was just a beginner. And obviously it's rich dad coaching. Like they're going to be so much further along. So really just pausing and asking the right questions. Like, Hey, this is the real problem that I'm experiencing. And can you help me solve that? And we have to be careful with the, Oh yeah, we're going to be great at that because of course they're going to tell you they're going to be great at it. The thing that I was going to say is it's black and white when it comes to real estate or HVAC or whatever. What isn't black and white is kind of like what you were talking about with your coaching um, and, and, and mindset coaching. Uh, my wife is a, a certified breathwork facilitator. She doesn't need to have a track record in HVAC to even if I'm an HVAC company owner, but I have some trauma work that I need to go through. She doesn't need to know anything about HVAC. She needs to know about, you know, trauma work and breath work. And so when we get into the mindset coaching arena, it's a little different, but it's still the same. I'm looking for somebody that just like you said, you know, you, you've, you've came out, you and I've spent a lot of time talking about this. Like you've came out of a lot, you've overcome a lot. Like you have the track record and ability to say, yes, I was, I, you know, I was in the doldrums. I was in, I was in the trenches. I, I was lost. And now I'm found and here's what I did to do it. And I have a framework that can help you get there. And so it's, it's a little bit easier getting somebody's track record. Are you a successful HVAC company owner? Then maybe it is, um, you know, there's a lot of coaches out there today. Um, and I know Aaron Vel Velke very, very well. Your coach is like, I mean, I've, I've spent time, you know, having a glass of wine and, and Aaron coaching me over a glass of wine. Um, so I think it's just taking the time and making sure again, that you're really clear on what you need and making sure that you resonate with that person, you like them and they have the track record to get you there. Yeah, yeah. And that was something that, so when we connected in Austin, that was a big takeaway for me. So I had asked you um, some questions around the content that I was putting out and some, you know, socially hot topics and everything. And you really encouraged me to be my authentic self because then I'm going to connect with the right people when it comes to a coaching experience. And I had somebody else who actually gave me the complete opposite <laughs> advice. And it, you know, I had to leverage my emotional intelligence when it came to this advice, but they were telling me, Hey, leave all of that stuff out of it. Anything when it came to social issues or politics or anything, leave all of that stuff out of it. If you want to be successful in business. And I'm like, I disagree, you know, and it's because if I want to be effective in building a coaching relationship, I need them to connect with me. And if they don't connect with me, that's completely fine. Then they are going to go out and they're going to find the right person for them. But it's important for me to be authentic. Otherwise, this entire coaching relationship is built on something that's fake. Because for me, content is me putting myself out there. Same thing with the podcast, putting myself out there so people can get to know who I truly am and my story so we can connect and have that sense of loyalty to each other when it comes to this relationship and trust. Like trust is key. So if I'm out there putting out stuff that isn't authentic, how can this person then trust me in order to guide them along this process that's going to be full of discomfort, full of ups and downs and everything like that. Like you have to have a, a high sense of trust in that person that you're entering a coaching relationship or a business relationship with. So that advice that you gave me in Austin, that really stuck with me. And now what I, the, the other big thing I took away was like, 
only do it when it feels right. If something's pressing on me that I feel that I need to say something about it, do it. But if it's like, I'm just doing it to get views or to get more followers, whatever, then I'm not going to do it because that's again, being inauthentic and not living my personal mission and purpose. So I really, really appreciate that. And, and that takeaway from our, our talk in Austin. So one last question, because you actually kind of nailed all the, the typical wrap up questions that, that we ask Mike, but one thing to, to uh, last question, then anything else that we didn't cover, if you wanted to hit on, but uh, what's one big book or podcast that's really impacted you recently? For me, you know, I've talked a lot about 10X is easier than 2X. That has completely changed my mindset around way more than just business or what we're doing with Ideal, but from a relationship standpoint and getting to that freedom of time. So is there anything recently that's really impacted you that you like to share? Well, I'll, I'll touch on just because you brought it up, but the 10X is easier than 2X. I coached with Dan Sullivan for a couple of years. Um, in the 10X program, uh, my partner and I would go to Toronto and we were in the room with Dan. And, you know, so I've been exposed to the mindset around it a little bit. And when, when Ben Hardy, he came and spoke to the GoBundance group um, pre-launch and was just talking about the book. And um, I told Kara, I said, I, I don't want to read that book. <laughs> and she said, why not? And I said, well, because there's, there's some things that I um, have been stewing on and, and are, are percolating in me. Um, and, and I want to remain focused and I know that 10X is greater than, is easier than 2X is going to cause me to really, you know, sit back. This is in my nature and personality. It's going to cause me to really sit back and do what we were talking about with the genius quadrant, like really look at all areas of, and this isn't a bad thing, by the way, it's a good thing, but I just knew what that book was going to do to me. Um, and it was going to cause me because it's in my nature to really question whether I should, um, you know, be playing small <laughs> And the whole concept and principle there is, you know, the reason why 10X is easier than 2X is because you're forced, you're forced to do those things or to delegate and, and maybe even some of the things that I enjoy, or I feel like I'm the only one that can do it. You're forced to get out of those. And so um, that book has made an impact on me. I did pick it up. I did read it. And the reason why I went to a, I helped facilitate a, a mastermind a couple of weeks back in, a, in Alaska and the guys that are actually leading that mastermind, there's two guys and they asked two of us to come help facilitate. They, they made it mandatory reading for all the guys. And so I was like, well, if it's mandatory for them, I'm gonna have to read it. Um, so that's one of them actually that has impacted me. But the other one that I'll say, um, this book recently, um, Living Fearless by Jamie Winship. Um, and I'm not even all the way through it, but I was on a call a couple of weeks back and Jamie Winship has been recommended to me by a few different people. Um, in the last few months, you know, and when, 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 when somebody's name comes up over and over, I'm like, okay, God, what are you trying to tell me? And then, and then Jamie was in a, a group that I'm in called the Wellspring speaking to us. And that whole principle um, and, and the sub tagline is exchanging the lies of the world for the liberating truth of God. And this book is really just like a journey of like who we were created to be versus who we're living. And so this is, I'm right in the middle of this book, really kind of, you know, really making a deep impact on, on, on me right now. Because again, I think a lot of times, you know, we spend a lot of time with these preconceived ideas. And that's what I kind of started the podcast with is just be careful what season you're in. Because the ideas that served me about myself, and even the skill sets, the tool bag that I had three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, they're not the same. Um, as what you might need today. And even that conversation that I started with, you know, where feeling like maybe the last 10 years, I wasn't as successful. No, I was right where we intended to be because I wanted to be present with my kids. But what I found myself really looking at and talking to a few mentors, I'm in a group called Front Row Dads with um, John Vroman and a bunch of other dads too. But um, I really didn't want to join that group a few years back because I was like, you know, I'm, I'm transitioning away from being a dad. I've got another year or two until my kids are gone. And John Vroman and Mike McCarthy, both at different times, Mike's one of the founders of GoBundance told me, he's like, you know, they're, they're like, you're, you're just entering a different season, a different version of being a dad. Like maybe the most important season of their life is when they become young adults, because now rather than us just shaping and guiding and and, and, and pouring into them constantly, they're in a season where, yeah, they don't need me all the time, but when they need me, they really need me. When they come and ask for the advice, they really need that advice. And so we might be in an even more 
important season. But the thing that I'll say with all of that is I realized through the last year or two entering kind of like a new season of parenting, of relationship with my wife, of myself, like I'm ready to grind. So the mic that you would have talked to two years ago, four years ago, that's like, Hey, you know, don't get burnt out. Like, take it easy. Like be present. Like I'm ready to grind and my wife's ready. And you know, like we can work from anywhere in the world. I'm, I'm ready for round two. I'm ready for the version of me that was like on fire when we started our first company. But then I kind of started tapering back because I had my freedom and really what freedom meant to me was spending time with my children. Well, I'm entering a new season. And so we have to be aware just because I built a certain version of me five years ago, doesn't mean that he's valuable to me today. And so that guy, even though I worked really, really hard to create a version of me that was slowed down, present, didn't work too much. Sometimes you got to pull a gun out and you got to shoot that version of you in the head. And I know that sounds extreme, um, but <laughs> I like it. I'm all for extreme, man. Yeah. But like we, and, and that's why like living fearless is perfect timing for me because I think we have to be careful of a previous version that we've built of ourselves when we're moving into a new place, because things that were, you know, we're so good at developing or, or like developing habits, but then also like getting rid of bad habits. But sometimes when we worked really hard to build a good habit, like, you know, you were talking about accountability and all sometimes when we worked really hard to build certain things in our life, maybe it's even a morning routine that no longer serves you. It's really hard to kill that version because we worked so hard and it was a very valuable skill set in our tool bag that no longer serves us. And so I think as humans, we just got to be really careful what season and cycle we're in and realize that just because we worked really hard to build something doesn't mean it's serving us anymore. Yeah. And I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think part of that, because you, you create this routine, you know, whether it's morning routine or whatever, you create this routine in your life and it becomes, it creates predictability in your life. You, that, that predictability of that routine becomes comfortable. So we get so caught up and I can't walk away from that because what happens when I don't have it anymore? Do I go back to the person that I was before that? Or do I evolve into the next version of myself and embrace this next season? And I think that's something that, that we, you know, for myself, I lived in this debilitating fear of what if I go out and this doesn't work out? And then I had to make a choice. Well, do I want the fear? Do Am I going to live based on the fear of that? Or am I going to live based on the fear of if I don't do this, if I step out of the predictability into the unknown and I fail, is that more of a regret or less of a regret than never trying? And that was where a lot of the change in my life recently has really, you know, came from is the fear of, I know if I don't do this now, I'm going to regret it. And one thing that you said in there also was when you hear those names that consistently come up, I just had that happen recently with Ryan Holiday. So the Daily Stoic, I, you know, and his name just kept coming up, coming up. And then I got somebody sent me a book of his and I read it and I'm like, oh yeah, this makes sense because I, re I didn't even realize that. Like, I'm a Stoic and I had no freaking clue. I didn't even know what Stoicism was at that point. And I'm spitting out these quotes and everything that are just coming off the top of my head. I'm like, oh, okay, well, now I know why this name came up because it's so relatable. And so what I need in this period of my life when I'm realizing that my unhappiness came from a lack of effort. And another thing that you said in there is who we, who we were created to be in like the way that I interpreted that and who we currently are and how we're living sometimes don't align and there's this internal conflict. And that's where it was for me is I, I desperately wanted to be a good person, but I was battling with addiction and allowing that to consume my life. And again, like that all stemmed for me from a lack of discipline. It was really leaning into who I was created to be. And now that I'm aligned with that person who I feel like I was created to be, I'm full of joy. I'm full of happiness. That empty is, that emptiness is gone from my life. I'm a better husband because of it. I think I'm being becoming a better business partner because of all of that and really just aligning with who I was created to be. So, Mike, that was absolutely incredible. Anything else you wanted to leave the listeners with, um, including how to follow along with your journey, um, how to get a hold of you if they're interested in the mastermind or anything along those lines? 
Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll polish off what we were just talking about because I think this is really important. Um, we were in Hawaii a couple of years ago, me and the kids, and and we all decided that we we're going to get tattoos at some point in time. We haven't done it. Um, and I might only, I might be the only one that ends up doing this because it's so impactful to me, but like, it's the concept of who told you that. And you were just talking about, you know, like whether it's being an addict or, you know, certain ideas that are in our head, or even like what I was saying, a good version of myself uh, uh, that, you know, I, I have fear around. And so the statement of who told you that, um, I think is super important for us to think about. And when the kids and I and Kara were talking about this in Hawaii, um, I was thinking back to the story at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis where, you know, God shows up in the garden. And I don't know if the Garden of Eden was like an actual, I don't know if that experience actually happened or not, but like, it's a great story. Um, God shows up and Adam and Eve had eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God shows up and, and he's like, Adam, Eve, where are you? And I'm paraphrasing, right? And they're, they're like, they're hiding. They're hiding from God. And, and he's like, why are you hiding? And, and they said, well, we're afraid because we're naked. And he said, who told you that? And like, there's so many things in that story. I, I love stories, by the way, because like, I think we can just relate to it. But there's so many things in that story. He said, who told you that? Because this was the first time in their life that they had hidden from God. And so when we're hiding from things, including, you know, things in business or, you know, hiring a coach, or maybe somebody's on the fence about working with you or whatever, when we're hiding from things, it's because somebody told us something, who told you that? And maybe it's even a preconceived idea in our mind or something that we're telling ourselves. And I think we have to connect to this from what could be a negative perspective, but also like a positive, because like one thing, an experience that I had recently, and I'm going to make this really quick. Um, I, my default answer for the last 12 years has been no. If you said to, if Jamie called me up and said, Mike, we're having a mixer at the Ascend and Emerge event in Austin, Texas, and I want you to come for a couple hours and hang out, I would have said no. Just an absolute flat out no. Can't do that. I've got kids at home, you know, family dinner every night. No. Well, a while back, I was like, I started realizing like my default no, which was a very, very powerful, strong muscle that I had built is actually causing me challenges in this day and age, because most nights the boys were not living at home. Kate was at home, but, and sometimes she wasn't at home. She's with her friends or whatever. And my default answer is no. And so it's keeping me from building connections, connections, you know, reaching my calling, helping other people. And so my default no, which was a very strong muscle that I had built. And back to the, who told you that I told myself this and I built it, but that, that version of me is still telling myself, I can't go do something um, because my default is no. And so I'm not a default. Yes. Now I'm a default. Let's stop and think about this. And so we just have to challenge ourselves. There's a fear-based perspective too, on, you know, certain things like I used to be this way. And so I can't go do that anymore because I'm an addict. I can't go, you know, be at an event like Emerge and Ascend where people are drinking. Um, and that's just so far past me now. I don't have to live in that fear anymore. But we have to constantly question ourselves around that. Like, who told you that? And usually it's a previous version of ourselves that was a strong purpose, a strong driver that maybe is no longer serving us. And so I just wanted to kind of share that because um, a lot of times, what we work really hard to build and get away from at some point in time, we no longer have to run from. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it was so funny. So when you hit on that about the, the nose, so one, first of all, I'm glad, I'm very glad that you did say yes to, to the Austin event because that's where we initially connected and I'm very appreciative of that. So thanks for saying yes to Jamie when he called you about that, but I was on the opposite end of the spectrum. I was, my, I was a default. Yes because I didn't want to let anybody down. I was a people pleaser and there came with so much pain and anguish in, in doing that because I would say yes. And then the time would come and every ounce of energy in me wanted to then say no. And was I thankful that I said yes to some things, whether it was going to a certain period? Yes, absolutely. But I wasn't being respectful of myself and my own time. And that's where we talk about loyalty a lot is if you really want to be effective and show up for people, you also have to be loyal to yourself. And I think there's a lot of power in being intentional 
with your yeses and your noes. And that was where you, you said it at the end there was, you know, you really have to be reflective, think through this before I give you any answer at all, whether it's yes or no. So, but I often, I just feel like we often find ourselves on one end of the spectrum or the other. We have that default setting that you were saying, and I never really thought about it in those terms, but yeah, I was a default yes. And then I would come and then I started becoming somebody who was inconsistent, who couldn't be relied on because I would say yes. And then maybe at the last minute, I'm like, I really don't want to do this. It's not adding value to me. And I don't think I'm going to add much value in this specific situation. So why, why am I doing it? Right. So then I became, you know, and I don't, that's the last thing I want to do is be somebody who's flaky, who's canceling at the last minute. So it really forced me to become intentional with my yeses and really think, thinking through things. Honestly, that's a big reason. So I'm in Texas right now. We're moving back home to Ohio in less than two weeks. So we leave Thursday the 27th to head back to Ohio. But I was just so overwhelmed with yeses and my time being consumed with all these plans and everything. I'm like, you know what? I'm going away from everybody. I'm going to go down to Texas where I can be alone for four months and I don't have to say yes because there's no one down here to say yes to. So it's been empowering. Um, and also, you know, I'm going to carry that habit at home, just being intentional with those yeses. So Mike, thanks again. So the podcast, you know, Instagram, how can people follow along with your story? And, you know, if they're interested, get involved in the mastermind and reach out to you. Yeah. So, uh, you mentioned the podcast investing for freedom. It's on all the platforms. So investing for freedom with Mike Ayala. Um, I'm going to, that genius quadrant that we were talking about, if anybody wants a copy of that, um, cause I think this is a tool that will really help your audience. Um, just text me the word genius to 480-531-7519. And I'll make sure you get a copy of that Excel sheet. Um, I think anybody that actually uses this in their life is, is probably going to see some major impact. And then the last thing I'll say is, you know, Instagram, I, I'm probably most active there at the Mike Ayala. Same thing. If you text the word genius there, just shoot me a DM and I'll make sure you get it. But um, yeah, best place to find us. We do have the couples mastermind. It's a virtual community. There is a, there is a full mastermind too, but it's only it's reserved for five couples. It doesn't actually open up till January of 2024, but there is a virtual community. It's $3.99 a month. Um, two calls. We bring in amazing coaches, speakers, all this, all this stuff. So um, if you got any couples in the community that are looking to kind of level up their relationship, this is not a, this is not a counseling program. This is a next level couple mastermind. So if you got some people in your audience that are interested in that and want to level up, you know, their relationship, grow together in finances, parenting, all the things um, we'd love to have you. So you can go to nextlevelcouple.com to find that. Yeah, absolutely. Can you say that phone, that number to text um, if anybody's looking for that quadra one more time? Yeah, 480. Yep. So, <laughs> I, it's <laughs> funny. Because, <laughs> I almost gave you my personal cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> we could have added that part out. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's 480-531-7519. All right. Awesome. Because that is definitely something that I think is going to be a useful tool for a lot of people out there. So one of the big things that come that people come to me with and they're they're, I think they think more so than well, it, it's a symptom of the root cause. So a lot of people come to me and they're like, hey, I'm really struggling with time management. And realistically, when I get into a conversation with them, I'm like, yeah, it makes sense that you're struggling with time management. It's not really time management, so you're, you're taking on entirely too much. It's like at the end of the day, there's only 24 hours in the day. And if you dedicate six to eight hours of that to sleep, now we're getting down and there you can, you just, you have to put things down in order to remain effective at the important things in life. And I think that quadrant that you're talking about could be very, very beneficial for a lot of people out there, myself included, as I transition into really leaning into that 20% that genius area in my life and in, in the journeys and what we have going on here with ideal. So Mike, thanks again for the time. It was absolutely incredible. Thank you so much and look forward to some continued conversations with you and, and, you know, on this path of, of success and, and greatness and freedom of time. So thanks Mike. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. It's been great. Hey everybody, if you like what you heard today, please check us out on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And don't forget to head to Eventbrite and grab one of the 10 tickets available for our monthly Ideal Connect call. 
Then when you're ready to take the next step, message us on any of our social media pages to book a free coaching consultation call to see how we can help you start living your own ideal life. Thanks again for all of your love and support. And always remember, you have everything you need to achieve success. It's just a matter of believing.